Okay, so in this video, we're going to be carrying on again. We're going to be jumping right back to producer theory. So that was quite a while ago. We were taking a look at perfect competition. We we're taking a look at our spectrum, right? We have this continuum of different market structures from perfect competition on one extreme all the way to monopoly on the other extreme. And then in between, we have this monopolistic competition and this oligopoly. We're going to be going back to that. We're going to be looking at that again. So with this comes all of our cost curves, marginal cost, average total cost, average variable cost, average fixed cost, marginal revenue, Q star, right? All of this stuff is going to come back to us. So, okay, you might need to go back. You might need to refresh your cost curves, granted, but it will be coming back. We'll be taking a look at all that again. Big thing going on as we take a look at this, though, is we're really taking a look at the presence of market power. So that was one of our causes of market failures. We'll be taking a look at what market power looks like in this context, why it causes a market failure. And in this case, we're going to be looking under it underneath the lens of market structure of a monopoly. So to start off, first, we're going to go through that determinants of market structure. Again, we'll list our continuum. From there, we're going to go through again, we're going to refresh ourselves. What are our basic assumptions of firm behavior? Firms exist to maximize profit. Right, there we go, I gave it to you. We'll then go and we'll refresh our cost curves, get our minds for good for that, and our profit maximizing level of output. How did we determine that guy again? So we'll go through all that, then we'll go and we'll change things up, we'll take a look at what things look like for a monopoly, introduce this world, and we'll demonstrate why monopolies, why any firm with market power, any time a market structure allows for market power, we're going to have a market failure. And that's how we'll wrap this up, taking a look at that. So without further ado, let's go jump over and let's go take a look at this and our continuum. So again, taking a look at our continuum, let's get this guy drawn out here. We had one extreme all the way across to the other. We had over here our perfect competition and right we had we looked at perfect competition in a lot of detail earlier on what we then had over on the other extreme let's change colors for this we had our monopoly and if we wanted to kind of compare and contrast what was going on in our determinants of market structure so perfect competition this guy here had lots of small firms all right so keep in mind lots meant that with respect to the entire market supply well there was lots of them and small meaning that hey any one firm was a drop in the bucket in their ability to supply right so that is no one firm mattered no one firm was able to do anything to affect that market supply on its own that's what we mean by lots of small we then talked about product differentiation. And in terms of product differentiation, that is, hey, does this firm sell anything different than that firm? Well, we said that underneath perfect competition that we had homogenous goods. So, okay, what does that mean? Homogenous goods, meaning that everything, everybody, every firm sold the exact same thing, right? If they were apple orchardists, every firm just sold the exact same apples, at least the consumer couldn't tell the difference between apples from different orchardists or didn't care to. Finally, finally, we took a look at barriers. And in this case here for perfect competition, we said, yes, there were no barriers. You were free. So, sorry, I just completely did a double on that one there. I said, yes, there are no barriers. Wait, which one? Okay, there are no barriers for a perfectly competitive firm. No barriers means that firms are free to enter, they're free to leave based off of profit motive, right? Based off profit incentive. So again, keep in mind with that positive economic profit, that was a signal to enter an industry that's saying, hey, this is a good place to park your energy. If we had negative economic profit, that was a good signal to get out. That was a signal that somewhere else is better to put your time, energy, money, capital, etc. So get out, find that other industry that has the positive economic profit. So barriers are whether or not we are allowed to respond to those incentives. And for perfect competition, we said there were no barriers. You're free to enter and exit. Well, let's, let's compare that to monopoly. So lots of small 
in this case here, we just have one large firm, right? So just one big firm. They are the entire market. There's nobody else supplying to this market, just that firm. The entire market demand is being satisfied by one firm. What about degree of product differentiation? In this case here, we said, hey, every firm provides the exact same good. Well, in this case here, you could almost say that you have perfect differentiation, right? I'm just going to say differentiation. And that is because, well, there's no one else that sells anything that's a close substitute, right? They are the only one that sells this good or anything like it. Thus, they have a monopoly over it. They're the only one. So nothing at all that's a substitute. Finally, we're going to presume that there are large barriers. That is, there are barriers that, hey, even if this monopolist was able to earn huge economic profits, nobody else could enter, nobody else could get at those economic profits because there's barriers preventing them from entry. And we'll talk about those barriers as we go in. Just to round out our conversation, in the next videos coming up, what we're going to be taking a look at as well, right? This finishes off our semester. So what we're going to be taking a look at as well, after Monopoly, we're going to be jumping over here to, oh, wrong tool, to monopolistic competition. And if we wanted to list out what's going on in monopolistic competition, we are again going to have lots of small firms. So very similar to perfect competition. But in this case here, we're going to have slight differentiation. That is, one firm is going to differentiate their good, their service from the other firms in a slight way. Maybe in quality, maybe in taste, maybe in preferences. There's going to be some kind of differentiation between firm A and firm B. For example, if we take a look at fast food, hey, McDonald's has their Big Mac, A&W has their Teen Burger. They're ultimately both just burgers, but each has their slight differentiation on what a burger is, what should go on a burger, and thus each one has its own market. In this case here, finally, in terms of barriers, we're going to presume just for simplicity that there are no barriers. But often you may see this market structure occur with small or slight barriers. So keep that in mind, but for our sense, we're going to presume no barriers at all. Finally, the last one we'll look at is going to be our oligopoly. And for an oligopoly, we're just going to have a few large firms. And in this case here, there may or may not be differentiation. May or may not. So differentiation is not necessarily a defining feature of this market structure. We may, we may not have differentiated goods. So we can overlook that one a bit. Finally though, just like a monopolist, we are going to have barriers. And just like a monopolist will have large barriers, so will an oligopolist. So large barriers here. For each of these, so monopolistic competition, monopoly, we're going to be taking a look at the cost curves. We're going to be identifying optimal levels of output. We're going to be taking a look at all of this and how it creates a market failure. Oligopoly fits right in the middle. The same is going to be true for them, but we're not going to be going and taking a look at their cost curves. We're not going to be going into that because it gets rather difficult for a 103 level. What we're going to take the advantage of in that case, however, is we will, with oligopoly, introduce a concept known as game theory. And that is, we're going to take a look in this oligopoly bit, really our big focus will be, how do you make choices and strategy, right? How do I decide what to do based off of what you're going to do? But mind you, then you're going to have to decide what you're going to do based off of what I'm going to do. But I know what you're going to do, so I'm making my decision based off of that. But then you know what I'm doing, but I know what you're doing, right? Recursively into infinity. That's the idea behind game theory. We'll take a look at that. It's a lot of fun and really how an oligopolist will operate and determine, okay, how much do I produce? How do I compete? What do I end up doing in the long run in the short run? But, okay, all of that to say, let's carry on. Let's take a look at our monopolist. 
Before we jump into Monopolis, though, let's refresh our memory as to firm behavior. Let's refresh our memory about cost curves. And let's refresh our memory about how we determine our optimal level of output, all of that. So that is to start off. To start off, we'll refresh ourselves. We'll look again at perfect competition. So let's go there. Perfect competition. Just to remind ourselves what we're looking at. Okay, so starting off taking a look at our cost curves. Let's do that. We're gonna have our cost curves. We have our price. We have our quantity. And to start off, let's start off with our average variable cost dips, rises up, right? Keep in mind we have these U-shaped cost curves. Average variable cost, that was my labor cost, right? And hey, this here, keep in mind, this is in the short run. In the short run, what's our determinant of the short run? Capital is fixed, right? Capital is fixed. I have fixed costs. My capital costs are my fixed costs. Okay, I'm also going to have my average total cost. So starting off higher, hitting a minimum, and then rising up, it will get closer to my average variable cost, but it will never ever touch my average variable cost, right? The difference here, the vertical distance between these two lines at any point, right? I could take any vertical distance between these two lines. Notice they're different. That there, that vertical distance is my average fixed cost. So I can always infer my average fixed cost from that vertical distance. Okay, let's get rid of those lines. Linking and really driving our cost curves. Linking and driving our cost curves was our marginal cost. Okay, so we have our marginal cost and then kind of points of interest as we go through this. We can label them here. We'll go that's A, B, and C. We said A, hey, that is the capacity of the firm. B, that there, that's our really where we begin to, begin to experience our diminishing average return. So from B onwards, we experience diminishing average returns, and technically that's returns to labor. And then finally C, that point there, that is our minimum marginal cost, the highest point of our marginal product of labor. From C on, we experience diminishing marginal returns to labor. So few few things going on there. What we then have, what we then have is we have our market, right? So let's just draw our market right next to it. We didn't really have this full kind of picture of a market yet when we were taking a look at perfect competition to start, but now we do. So let's let's take a look at it. Here is some representative firm. So one firm in a perfectly competitive market. And we have our demand, maximum willingness to pay, marginal benefit, and we presume this is for a private good, right? So marginal social benefit equals marginal private benefit. We'll presume this is for a private good, so marginal social cost equals marginal private cost. There we go, supply marginal cost. What we witness is that we then get some market price. Let's, uh, let's drag that down, make that actually at equilibrium. There we go. We get some market price and some quantity exchanged. There we go. And what we can witness is that, hey, if this P and this P are the same scale, well, we could just draw this guy right across, something like that. And keep in mind, our perfectly competitive firm, they're just a price taker. They just take this price that the market gives them and they say, okay, yep, I'm too small. I cannot influence this price. If I charge anything above this price, no one will buy my stuff. If I charge anything below this price, everybody will buy my stuff. But okay, I wouldn't want to charge lower, have everyone buy my stuff because everybody will also buy my stuff at the market price. 
So I get no benefit by charging anything less. So, okay, from a perfectly competitive firm's point of view, even though we have this downward sloping demand curve, the firm sees this as the price, the average revenue, the marginal revenue, or the firm, that one representative firm, they also see that as the demand for their good. Even though the actual demand is downward sloping, this is the only bit of the demand curve the firm sees. Okay, how did the firm decide where to produce? Well, their optimal level of production, their production level that was going to maximize their profit, was where marginal revenue equaled marginal cost. Right, so where the marginal cost and the marginal revenue intersected. So in our case here, those two lines, they intersected right there. Boom, there we go. Draw that down. We had our Q star. Okay, so that was our profit maximizing level of output. There was our price. We could then take this Q star back up Right, we can take it to the average total cost here. Well, let's use the actual line tool. Take it there, and right there, I would have my average total cost. So hey, price minus average total cost. Price minus average total cost. That there is my profit per unit. I am producing Q star units. So I could shade in this whole area here, height being my profit per unit, width or base being Q star, the number of units being sold, and this box, that box would be my profit. And in this case here, hey, price is above average total cost. That was my positive profit. I was profitable. Yes, great. Okay, then we could say, great, this is a perfectly competitive firm operating in the short run. What happens from here? Well, hey, they're earning positive profit. They're earning positive profit. Let's write that down. Positive profit in the short run. So, okay, hey, perfectly competitive. One of our determinants, there's no barriers. So firms respond to these profit signals. So positive profit, this encourages entry. Hey, entry is we have more firms in the market. Keep in mind, if we go back to our determinants of supply and demand, more firms, number of suppliers, number of suppliers, that was one of our determinants of supply. So as we have more and more suppliers, what begins to happen? Well, what begins to happen is this supply curve begins to shift to the right. right. It begins to make its way to the right. As it begins to make its way to the right, what happens to the price? Well, the price begins to fall. Quantity exchanged begins to rise. So this causes price to fall. As price falls, hey, keep in mind, price falls. As price falls, we'd move along this marginal cost curve. Eventually, we'd wind up right there at point A, such that causing price to fall will continue till price equals average total cost. That is at a price of Average price equal to average total cost, we will have, whoa, we will have zero profit and thus no more entry. So, in a nutshell, kind of our chapter going back to perfect competition. We drew our curves, we overviewed our curves, we took a look at profit maximizing level of output, Q star, and then we took a look at, hey, positive profit, hey, that encourages entry. We have no barriers, so entry can actually happen. Because entry can actually happen, supply shifts to the right, supply shifts to the right, price falls, continues in this fashion until we have zero profit, and we no longer have this incentive anymore. So our perfect competition sets.
Okay, things are changing though. We're now gonna be looking at monopoly. So in the case of perfect competition, we had the whole case where, hey, we had our initial quantity exchanged. So here, let's just get rid of this. We're looking at the initial situation before a positive profit caused all the exit. So we're looking at this initial case. Maybe we had a quantity exchanged of like one million apples. Well, while the quantity exchanged was one million apples, this one perfectly competitive firm, we'd call it a representative firm, their Q star, the amount that they themselves were supplying to this market was maybe only something like a thousand, right? Just a drop in the bucket with respect to the greater market on whole. And honestly, a thousand to a million, that's probably too much. We would say probably even more closely resembling maybe a hundred to a million, right? That'd be probably more realistic for a small firm with lots of them. Okay, as we move on to a monopoly though, for a monopoly, if the market wants a million apples, it's only that one firm. You don't have hundreds of thousands of firms all producing 100 apples. For a monopoly, you have one firm that satisfies the entire market. And that is in perfect competition because we had thousands all producing 100 apples. Well, each firm, they were just a price taker. They just said, okay, cool, I'm too small to influence the market. I can't do anything about it. I just view the price, the average revenue, the marginal revenue, the demand. I just view it as this horizontal line. My monopolist, my monopolist, not so. That is, my monopolist will actually view the market demand as the market demand. We'll actually view it as a downward sloping curve. So let's take a look at what that really means. So let's go over here. Monopolist, or for a monopoly. So, okay, we're going to have our price. We're going to have our quantity, price, quantity. And we're going to have our actual demand. That is our price, right? Okay. Ultimately, just like with perfect competition, monopolist, in fact, this can be helpful. All of our market structures, they will always find Q star where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, right? That will always be the case. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That will always be our profit maximizing condition, always yielding the optimal level of output, Q star. Problem with a monopolist that kind of makes things a bit more difficult is that, hey, look at this. Because the monopolist is supplying the entire market, if they decided to produce this much, they can charge this price. If they decide to cut their price or to cut their output, they can charge more as a result. If they decide to scale up their output, people won't be paying as much for it, so they charge less. That is, for perfect competition, all they got to choose was output, right? By choosing output, price was dictated to them. They only had to worry about output. A monopolist now needs to worry about this price quantity combination. Keep in mind, right? So profit is total revenue minus total cost. Profit is price times quantity minus uh, total variable cost plus total fixed cost. And right for a perfect competition, price was fixed. All I had to do is pick quantity. As I picked quantity, that also influenced my variable cost because, hey, variable cost, that was my labor cost. Right? That was for perfect competition. For my monopolist, well, same idea, price times quantity minus total variable cost plus total fixed cost. We'll go monop. Well, for monopolist, as I pick my quantity, I also then get a price. So quantity gives me price. As I pick a quantity, I also need some amount of workers. 
So I also end up picking my total variable cost as a result. So again, everything boils down to my choice of output. I'm always gonna choose a level of output. And by choosing output, I get a price, I get a cost structure as we go through. But here's the problem, all right? If that wasn't enough of a problem. For perfect competition, we went through, right? Perfect competition. We said, hey, average revenue equals marginal revenue, which was equal to the price. And then right at the end there, we said, hey, that's also equal to the demand. Let's see what's going on for a monopolist. Okay, so let's just put together a demand schedule here. So let's say that we have following, oh, let's use white for this. Let's say we have the following demand. So we have prices going, let's say 25, 20 and 15. And then we have quantity demanded yielding, a oh, lot of demand. So price is going down as price goes down, quantity goes up. So uh, let's just go something like this, two, four, and six. Working out, I can figure out, hey, what's my total revenue of this firm? Total revenue, that's just price times quantity, right? So, okay, total revenue, 25 times two, that yields 50. 20 times four, that'll be 80. And 15 by six, that gives me a total revenue of 90. Very similarly, right, I can go through, I can work out my average revenue, which again, keep in mind what that was, that was just total revenue per unit. And okay, 50 divided by two, well, oh, that's 25. 80 divided by four, well, that's 20. And 90 divided by six, well, okay, that's 15. So we see in this case, just like with perfect competition, that my average revenue was equal to the price. So, okay, hey, if that's the same, why, what are we doing here? Well, let's carry on. Let's take a look at our marginal revenue. For our marginal revenue, this guy here, keep in mind, change in our total revenue for a change in output. And okay, to get this guy to work, change in total revenue. So what did I get here? Plus 30 for a plus two. So okay, 30 divided by two is 15. Keep in mind, there's no first one because I don't know what I came from in that case. And then similarly, next one down. Oh, in this case, I'm only plus 20, but for again, a plus two. So now my marginal revenue is 10. Sorry, complete math error there. 80 to 90, that's clearly 10. 10 over two, that's clearly gonna be five. Well, they say mental math's not the strong suit today. Okay, so what we see going through this is, hey, my marginal revenue, clearly for a monopolist, my marginal revenue is not equal to price. In fact, my marginal revenue at each point along the way is less than price. This appears to be problematic because if we're trying to identify for a monopolist what their level of production is, we want to find the point such that marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And if marginal revenue doesn't have this nice easy relationship, it's going to become difficult to identify where our profit maximizing level of output was going to be. Well, okay, it doesn't pop out right away, but what we can actually work out is we can actually work out our slope in each scenario. So, okay, keep in mind our slope, what is this? Taking a look at our graph, we have our price, we have our quantity. So our slope is rise over run, change in price over change in quantity demanded. So, okay, if we work that out, let's go change in price. So we'd have a change in price of 20 minus 15. Well, we're gonna have a change, uh, yeah, 20 to 15, that's negative five. So my slope of my demand curve is negative five all over change in my quantity demanded plus two. So five over two, negative five over two gives me a slope of negative 2.5. 
So, okay, if I were to draw my demand curve in that way, let's use blue for a demand curve like we've been typically. I would have my demand. This is my price. That is my average revenue, right? We've seen this all the way through. And this guy here, it has a slope of 2.5, negative. All right, we'd have some value there and we're decreasing. What about my marginal revenue though? Well, my marginal revenue, change in price. Hey, marginal revenue, that's just dollars per unit, just like prices. So here, what do I have? 15 to five, that's negative 10 for a change in quantity demanded. Plus two. So, hey, that's negative 10 over two gives me five. Slope of five versus slope of negative two. I'm sorry, slope of negative five versus slope of negative 2.5. What we find, right, we could expand this out even farther. We could go one farther carrying on with our order, right? We have, what, 25, 20, 15. We could go down to 10 here. Same thing, 2, 4, 6. Next guy there would be 8. Total revenue in that case there, 50, 80, 90. Okay, next one is going to be 10 times 8. Oh, we're going back to 80. We must have gone over that inflection point of being elastic to inelastic. Average revenue, that will be 10. And okay, change in total revenue over that. So in this case here, we would have minus 10 all over plus two. So we would have negative five as our new marginal revenue. That's we're now losing money. Our extra revenue for an extra unit is now negative. In this case here, what do we have? Five to negative five. Well, that's another minus 10. And for another plus two. Hey, once again, that gives me a slope of negative five, right? This slope is constant throughout. But okay, what does that give us? Well, it gives us that, hey, this slope is twice as steep as the slope of my demand curve. And that will always be the case. It doesn't matter what demand schedule I pull out. I can just make up any demand schedule, work out the slope of the demand versus the slope of the marginal revenue, the marginal revenue will always be two times as steep as my demand curve. So I can take advantage of that. I can say, hey, if the blue line is my demand, oh, let's actually use a line. If the blue line is my demand, twice as steep coming down as such would be my marginal revenue. This guy here, slope twice as steep minus five. So, okay, great. I can have that. I can be taking a look now at my marginal revenue. If I have my demand, I can have my marginal revenue just two times as steep, and I can move forward from there in order to work out everything else. So, okay, now that we have demand, price, average revenue, marginal revenue, let's overlay this on top of our cost curves, and let's take a look at what's happening for a monopolist. So let's draw our cost curves to start off here. So again, this is for monopoly. Okay, so we're gonna have our price or our dollars per unit. We're gonna have our output, our quantity. And for our cost curves, right, to start off, we're gonna have average variable cost. Hey, cost curves stay the same. They are not dependent on market structure. I'm going to have my average total cost, right, starting off farther apart, hitting a minimum to the right of my average variable and getting closer together, linking the two together, coming up through the minimum point of each is my marginal cost curve. And then what we're going to have is our demand. So I'll use white for the demand curve itself just because I've already used blue for average total cost. So we'll have demand coming something like that. And keep in mind, right, this is monopoly. They see the entire market. So the market demand enters as the market demand. So there'd be my demand curve, demand average revenue price. And now I need to determine, hey, what is my optimal level of output. What is this monopolist going to produce 
given their costs and given the demand for their good. Well, in order to work that out, I need to know what my marginal revenue is. So marginal revenue, we can kind of take advantage of the fact that, hey, this is my demand. Marginal revenue will be twice as steep. So something about there will be the corresponding marginal revenue. And I now have all of my curves for this monopolist. How do I identify Q star? Well, again, just like in any other case, Q star, our profit maximizing level of output is when marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Where is that the case? Well, the yellow line's my marginal revenue, red line's my marginal cost. They intersect each other right there. So if we take that point, we draw it down. I'm going to get my Q star, my profit maximizing level of output. Okay, that's profit maximizing level of output. What's my price? Right, what commonly ends up happening, like we had done with our perfect competition, is we go, okay, boom, straight across, there's my price. But no, 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 no. Boom, straight across, that's my marginal revenue, marginal cost, right? All we're doing is saying Q star those two lines. So what's, what's my price? Well, we're going to take this Q star, we're going to draw this line straight up until we hit our demand curve. Demand average revenue price. So we take that, we drag this guy across, and that is our price. Q star, profit maximizing level of output, all the way up to the demand curve, and then across. Where are we at? Are we making profit? Are we losing money? Are we breaking even? What's going on here? Well, let's take a look. Let's compare price to average total cost. We take Q star up to our average total cost curve. Oh, again, let's use a line for that. Q star up to where it intersects our average total cost. Drag that guy across and we get the average total cost. So again, price minus average total cost is our profit per unit. We then have Q star units that we're selling. So we get this entire box from P all the way out to Q star. All of that. That is the positive profit which a monopolist earns. And the thing to keep in mind with this is, okay, cool. That's the positive profit monopolist earns. Where is this with respect to capacity? Well, if we were to do that, we said, hey, marginal cost equals average total cost, minimum average total cost. That was the capacity of the firm. What we witness is that a monopoly is able to earn positive profit below capacity. That wasn't possible for perfectly competitive firms, right? Perfectly competitive firms, we could kind of make this rule that, hey, if Q star was below capacity, negative profit. If Q star was at capacity, zero profit. If Q star was above capacity, positive profit. We can't say that for a monopolist. Cannot be said. For a monopolist, Q star with respect to capacity tells us nothing about profitability. Everything comes down to where that demand curve is, where that price curve is with respect to the marginal cost. So, okay, steps to showing this. We get our market demand. Twice the slope, that's our marginal revenue. From there, everything else goes in. Marginal revenue, marginal cost giving us Q star. Once we have Q star, we draw that vertical line up through all of our other lines. Everywhere that Q star line touches something else is the corresponding value of it. So, right, we took Q star, we dragged that up. Oh, right here, we hit our average variable cost. Carried it up, hit our marginal revenue marginal cost. Carried it up, average total cost. Continuing to carry it up, that's our price or our maximum willingness to pay. So our monopolist. Where are we though with respect to allocative efficiency? Has this actually created a market failure? Are we in trouble in this scenario? Well, let's, let's go explore that. Let's go back and take a look at a diagram we had previously looked at though. Okay, so here, what we're gonna be focusing on 
is this market scenario. And keep in mind, okay, our demand, yep, that's just the demand, all of our producers, sorry, all of our consumers, they're all their individual personal demand curves being aggregated up horizontally. Very similar, similarly, the supply marginal cost, this was all of these individual representative firms, all of their marginal cost curves being aggregated up horizontally to give us this market supply, this market marginal cost. Together, price, quantity exchanged, we had an allocatively efficient outcome. But let's start off with this whole demand side, but let's move from it being serviced by perfectly competitive firms to a monopolist. And let's take a look at what that all means. So starting off, we have our market. We have our price, we have our quantity. Starting off, we're gonna have our demand curve. And then we're gonna have upward sloping supply. That is also our marginal cost of the entire industry on whole, right? All of those representative firms aggregated together, giving us that. This yields for us the market price and the market quantity exchanged. So I'm gonna call that QPC price PC, right? For quantity underneath perfect competition, price underneath perfect competition. And let's keep in mind, taking a look at this, that at QPC, demand, marginal social benefit, supply, marginal social cost, hey, we're allocatively efficient. Right there, marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost. So we're good, right? We're allocatively efficient. What happens if we have a monopolist though? Let's say that some big fat cat capitalist comes in and buys out every single little firm in this market, right? It used to be thousands of tiny firms. This really rich dude comes in, he buys every single one of them and conglomerates them together. So now it's just one company. Well, okay, if that happens, Supply marginal cost, that stays the same, right? We just added up all these individual firms supply marginal cost curve. So if one guy came in and just bought all of them, well, okay, we'd have the same supply marginal cost. Just instead of adding up individual firms, it would just now be that one massive firm that had all these little guys in it. Demand, well, okay, that has nothing to do with the demand. So demand is unaffected. So it seems like, okay, wow, we just moved from perfect competition to monopoly and nothing changed in this. But no, 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 something did, right? Something did. The thing that changed was that from a perfectly competitive firm's point of view, from a perfect loop, sorry. From a perfectly competitive firm's point of view, this price point was the price average revenue marginal revenue. And again, I'll say from perfect competitive's point of view, right? And okay, marginal revenue equals all the marginal costs from all the firms. Boom, there we go. That's why we had equilibrium at equilibrium. But for a monopolist, this isn't the marginal revenue. For a monopolist, because now they get to see the whole market, they written as, hey, if I were to change my prices, if, so if I were to change my quantities, I'm gonna be changing my prices. They now look at this and they say, cool, something like this, yeah, that looks about twice as steep. Something like that, that is now my marginal revenue. And that's now the marginal revenue for the monopolist. Okay, what does this end up meaning for the market on whole? Well, the monopolist looks at this, they're gonna equate their marginal revenue with their marginal cost. Hey, that occurs right there. So marginal revenue, marginal cost, they're gonna go boom. That will be my profit maximizing level of output as a monopolist, Q star monopoly. And then what price am I gonna charge? I'm gonna go all the way up to the demand curve, what price the suckers are willing to pay. And I'll cut that across. And I'll have P 
monopoly. So what do we witness happening? As we jumped from that perfectly competitive outcome where marginal social cost equaled marginal social benefit, marginal private cost equaled marginal private benefit as well, we now have the monopoly outcome where, okay, there's our marginal social benefit. Down here, there's our marginal social cost. That is, hey, I no longer have this marginal cost pricing. I'm no longer allocatively efficient by using my market power, by being one large firm. I'm able to willfully hold my quantity back. By willfully holding my quantity back, I can push up the market price. And by doing both of these, I can really push up and maximize, get the highest possible profit I could ever get. All of that at the expense of society, all of that at the expense of the consumer. If we were to take a look at that, if we were to do a surplus analysis, we could do that surplus analysis. Let's break up all of these different shapes. We could have A, B, C, D, E, F, this little triangle here, G, and H. Okay. So initial, let's go initial. So underneath perfect competition, we had consumer surplus, we had producer surplus, and we had social surplus. Okay, initially, let's start off with that consumer surplus. So initially, below my willingness to pay, above the price I do pay, price perfect competition, we would have all of this as my initial consumer surplus. So what is that? That's going to be A plus B plus C plus D plus E. Producers. Producers initially, what were they getting? Well, they were getting above their willingness to accept, below the price they do accept. So... Underneath perfect competition, producers were getting all that. That is F plus G plus H. Society altogether then, what was society getting? Well, they were getting all of that. They were getting A all the way through H. So we had our initial kind of outcome there underneath perfect competition. What about as we move to being a producer, right? This fat cat capitalist buys everybody out. As that fat cat capitalist buys everybody out, so we're now at this yellow point, price monopoly, quantity monopoly. What happens to our consumer surplus? So again, we're now underneath a monopoly, consumer, producer, social. Starting off with the consumer. So, okay, consumer surplus below their willingness to pay, above the price monopoly that they now have to pay. Our new consumer surplus, A plus B. What about for the producer? Well, for the producer, we now have above their willingness to accept, below the price they do accept, so we see all of that. That is for the producer, we get C, D, F, G. C plus D plus F plus G. So clearly, clearly our producers win here, right? They captured C and D from the consumer. Society, society on whole, what did they get? Well, they get A, B, C, D, no E. F and G, no H. So we would have a deadweight loss, right? What society loses altogether, right? This is our cost to society from having a monopolist. That cost to society due to the inefficiency is E plus H. That is our cost from having this market served by a monopolist rather than being served by perfectly competitive firms. So that's our problem there.
in that way there, market power, the ability to control, to change your quantity in order to influence the price allows the firm to willfully hold their quantity down. By willfully holding their quantity down, they can push up the price and they create this market failure scenario. Okay, so that's our case with a monopolist. We see why it causes market failure to occur. Big question that probably comes in mind then is why do we have so many monopolies, right? If we look around in Canada, if we look around in most of the developed world, we have lots of monopolies. We have Canada Post, we have BC Ferries, we have BC Hydro, we have on and on and on and on and on. Well, we'll take a look at that first. We'll, we'll, sorry, we'll, we will take a look at that. What I want to take a look at first, however, is this idea of a cartel. And what a cartel is, is when perfectly competitive firms, when they get together to attempt to be a monopolist. And we see this, right? We see the most famous cartel is probably OPEC, the oil producing exporting countries, uh, Saudi, Venezuela, um, on and on and on and on. All of these countries, part of OPEC, they get together on their own. They'd be perfectly competitive, but together they have enough market power to pretend to be like a monopolist and to attempt to influence the market price. What we're going to witness is why these cartels form and why they never last. That is with OPEC, when they try to form this cartel to influence the price of oil, why it's successful initially, and then very quickly falls apart. So we'll take a look at cartels in that as well. We'll then move on to these barriers to entry, which then nicely wraps into that conversation that I just talked about as to why we have so many monopolies around us. And we'll talk about that to finish off. Okay, so the idea with cartels is that we start off with perfectly competitive firms. So in order to demonstrate this, let's suppose we have perfectly competitive firms earning zero profit in the long run. So they're at their long run profit condition. And let's just draw that to start off just so we can visualize what's happening. And Keep in mind, this, this all gets really ugly really fast. We'll try to do our best to kind of keep it as simple as possible. And so with that in mind, what we're going to do is we're going to draw these perfectly competitive firms just taking a look at their average total cost curve. So there we go. Average total cost. And then we'll have coming up through the bottom the marginal cost. Now we want to draw these for this firm earning zero economic profit. So that is a price point coming in right through the minimum. Let's let's fix that a little bit right through the minimum there. So we have price equals average revenue equals marginal revenue equals demand. And just to be clear, that was for perfect competition. So, okay, what do we have? We have our Q star. Q star taking place just like such. Such that Q star up and we have price equals average total cost. So we're earning zero profit, zero economic profit. These firms, okay, they're good. But let's suppose that they get together and they decide to create some kind of committee, some kind of panel, such that they all are going to agree to form a cartel. They're going to agree that, hey, individually, no one of us can influence the market. But if we all get together and pretend to act like a monopolist, that is, if we agree to cut our production, we can share monopoly level of profits between each other. So if these firms do that, these firms, they go and, okay, this marginal cost, that in this case would become marginal cost for the entire industry. Is this kind of would be the same thing for our market supply altogether? This average total cost, this would be kind of our industry average total cost. So we'd have that happening. But if we're witnessing it all together for the entire industry on whole, well, we're no longer witnessing this flat demand curve. We would now be witnessing the market demand curve. And that market demand curve, because hey, this is our price. Demand market, average revenue price, and I'll go cartel. Demand supply gives us what should be a market price right there, should be a quantity exchange right there. 
here let's just really let's just really highlight this this is my market demand I'll go over it in green the two whites was just a little bit too much white going on there so there we go market demand in green demand okay well now that we've come together and we've agreed to look at this market as a monopolist would, we've agreed to all cut our production in order to be able to wrap up the prices and share this monopolist level profit. Well, what ends up happening is as demand becomes steeper, well, our marginal revenue separates from our average revenue and we get a marginal revenue curve just like a monopolist that's twice as steep. So, okay, if that's our demand, twice as steep, somewhere about here. So I would have my marginal revenue. As our cartel, our cartel, right, marginal revenue cartel, as we get together, we'd look marginal revenue, marginal cost. We'd equate these guys right there. We would then say down. That would be my Q star underneath the cartel. That is, we've essentially just placed a quota on ourselves. We've gotten together, we've determined some profit maximizing level of output underneath a quota. We've put this on ourselves. We have this Q star cartel. We now need to figure out what price we're gonna charge underneath the cartel. So we take that Q star all the way up to our demand curve. Demand across, that's gonna yield for us our price underneath the cartel. Taking a look at this though, well, okay, price underneath the cartel, Q star all the way up. We have our average total cost. And as a result, what we get is this whole shaded area here. Ah, uh, let's actually shade that in properly. This whole shaded in here, profit per unit over Q star units. There we go. We would get all of this here as our positive profit. So there we go. Just by acting as a cartel, we've been able to, as a bunch of perfectly competitive firms, we've been able to get together, restrict our output. By restricting our output, we're able to push up the price and we're able to push ourselves into this positive profit scenario. Well, what's the problem with this? Why don't cartels tend to last? Well, the reason why cartels don't tend to last is twofold, twofold. Uh, let's take a look. First problem is that they are a whole bunch of individual profit maximizing firms. That is, it's just a loose agreement between all these firms to cut production. We'll take a look in a second that it's gonna now be in each firm's interest to ramp up production. And keeping in mind, because they're perfectly competitive, if only one firm decides to cheat, right, renege from this cartel agreement, if only one firm does, the price won't be affected. Nobody will ever know because every individual firm is so small. Problem is every firm knows this. Every firm begins to renege. Every firm goes to their new profit maximizing level of output and the whole thing collapses. So problem with that. Second issue Suppose we could control our members, we could prevent them from cheating from this cartel agreement. Our other kind of determinant of market, st market structure for perfect competition is that there are no barriers. So that is by creating this cartel, by having this positive economic profit, you are actually now incentivizing entry. So in order to prevent that and this new entry, right, this new entry is going to increase the supply, push down the price, erode all of this economic profit, bring you right back to where you were. So two possible fixes. First, you have to capture the new entrants. You have to capture the new entrants. You need to bring them into your cartel. Or alternatively, you need to create barriers. And we'll talk about what these barriers might be in the subsequent bit, but those would be your two options. Let's go back though, let's go back to number one here, that the fact that these individual firms are profit maximizing. Well, that means if these individual firms are profit maximizing, well, let's focus on this fact here that, hey, this is our marginal cost. And let's suppose this is, right, just our marginal cost for that individual firm, representative firm. So we're just looking at one firm altogether. 
Well, that one firm, they have successfully pushed up the market price to P cartel, meaning that underneath the cartel, this individual firm is now looking at this. I'll go price prime equals average revenue prime equals marginal revenue prime equals demand. Right? This is what the perfectly competitive firm is individually seeing. So cool, underneath the cartel, they were able to hold down their quantity, push up the price, and earn this positive profit. But now the individual firm, let's use, well, let's use green for this level of Q star. The individual firm, they're looking at their marginal revenue, they're looking at their marginal cost, and they're saying, hey, 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 look at this. My marginal revenue equals marginal cost is out there. I'll call that Q star cheat. And hey, at Q star cheat, what do I have? Let's go back up. Q star cheat to average total cost. That's something like this. There's that corresponding average total cost. Meaning that, hey, if I cheat, wow, my profit, let's use green for this profit, would be price cartel minus price cartel all the way down to that new average total cost all the way over to Q star cheat. That is by cheating from this cartel arrangement, I could even get more, I could get a huge increase in my economic profit. I could capture this entire box as economic profit, right? Massively increase it. And the cool part is, the best part of is, because hey, I'm just a perfectly competitive firm, I'm so small, so insignificant, that if I'm the only one who cheats from this cartel agreement, no one will catch me. And I can just earn huge economic profit and keep laughing. Okay, the problem is, this is what every individual firm thinks, right? Every individual firm looks at this and realizes, hey, I can cheat, I can get this huge economic profit, and no one will catch me. But then everybody does this. As everybody does this, what we end up doing is you'll notice Q cheat is above what our original level used to be. So we end up flooding the market with this good. We end up creating too much of this good because everybody is cheating. As everybody cheats, we flood the market, causing the price to collapse. As the price collapses, we wind out right back to where we started at this whole thing, which is that original level of Q star before we form the cartel and the cartel collapses around us. So in this way here, we've demonstrated why cartels are inherently unstable. They have this incentive to form, to kind of collude, to create this economic profit. However, once they've created this, they're going to have the incentive to break it apart because they're going to be better off by cheating than by staying together, at least temporarily. And as a result, the cartel will fail. How, how can you have a successful cartel? Well, as we've already alluded to, two different things. You need to be able to control your individual firms. You need to be able to have some kind of check in place to prevent them from cheating because they're going to have a strong incentive to cheat. So that's the first thing you need to do. Control your members. Second thing you need to be able to do is you need to be able to overcome these barriers, either by capturing new members as they come in and bringing them into the cartel or by creating barriers in order to prevent them from entering. So in that sense there, let's go take a look at these barriers and let's take a look at what some of these barriers are, both created and not. Let's take a look at that next. Okay, so for barriers, we're gonna look at a few different barriers, uh, barriers to entry. The first, we're gonna kind of break this part into two separate one. We're gonna be taking a look at natural barriers versus created barriers. And right, keep in mind, yes, we're in this topic about monopolies. We were just taking a look at cartels. These barriers, these apply to any type, uh, any time we have barriers, right? So maybe it's for a monopolist, maybe it's for an oligopolist, maybe it's for a cartel that formed and was able to create these barriers as well. Let's start off taking a look at these natural barriers because these natural barriers are really that one that explains why we have so many monopolies in the world around us. So, okay, what are these natural barriers? 
Uh, these natural barriers, these are essentially just given the, we'll go extreme capital cost to enter necessitates only um, we'll go only one or a few firms at their minimum efficient scale. Right, and minimum efficient scale, keep in mind that's our long term kind of situation on that long run average cost curve. So, essentially, given the nature of your industry, given the nature of the market that you're entering, you have such a capital intensive industry that it isn't possible for every firm to hit their minimum efficient scale if you have lots of firms competing. So, an example of this would be something like BC Ferries. Right, so if we were to take a look at BC Ferries, you have these massive capital costs of, well, okay, first of all, you have the ferries. Second, you have all of the terminals, which are massive terminals to build these, and then the berths for loading all the vehicles, everything that goes with that, right? All of this, this is a huge capital cost. Now, mind you, just in itself, that huge capital cost is not necessarily an issue. The issue arises that we have this huge capital cost, but we only have a limited demand, right? And let's suppose that currently BC Ferries hits the entire demand that there is for ferry service. That is, let's suppose that even if a new competitor were to come in to compete with BC Ferries, uh, we really wouldn't get, right, even if we lowered prices a little bit, we wouldn't get that much more demand. That is, we could say demand for ferry service is very inelastic. So let's take a look graphically what, what exactly that means. So here we go. No, let's go try that again. Got a straight line going on there. Okay. So we would have price, we would have our quantity, and we'd have our long run average cost curve. There we go. There's our long run average cost curve right about there. That is our minimum efficient scale. And let's suppose that right now BC Ferries Let's suppose right now BC Ferries is able to operate at their minimum efficient scale. That may be the case. They may be below it. They may be above it. I'm not sure. But let's just suppose for this example here that that is their minimum efficient scale. What happens then if we allow another competitor into this market? So all of a sudden we have a second ferry service entering. They overcome this huge capital cost to entry. But our demand for ferry services is extremely inelastic, right? So it looks something like that, right? That is, it's pretty much entirely at that minimum efficient scale. So what's going to happen is that as we begin, as we now enter into this, well, we're here at our minimum efficient scale. The new firm, this is essentially our entire quantity demanded. Right? That's the entire quantity demanded. Even if we lowered prices a little bit, we wouldn't get very much more. This entire quantity demanded now needs to be split between two firms. That is, okay, let's say this is something like, just to make it a nice easy number, let's say that's something like a thousand, maybe that's a thousand vehicles a day. Now this thousand vehicles a day needs to be split between two competitors. So now each competitor is at a place like this. Right? They're now sharing, they're now splitting this entire demand for ferry services. Instead of just BC ferries having 1,000 a day, they're now both splitting 500 a day. What does that mean? Well, it means that each firm now, each firm now is going to be farther to the left on their long run average cost curve, 
meaning they're going to have higher average costs, right? Take a look originally, originally at their minimum efficient scale, lowest possible cost per unit. But by splitting this capital between two of them, by splitting this market between two of them, both cannot hit their minimum efficient scale. Only one is able to, the market can only handle one of these firms. So by splitting it, we increase our costs. By increasing our costs, well, higher costs may, might end up eating into our profitability, might make it so that it's not possible for both of these firms to be profitable, right? The market can only handle one of them. The market can only handle one, so this increased cost pushes down the profitability, one of them is forced to exit. Alternatively, maybe it doesn't quite eat into their profit, well, it does eat into their profitability, but it doesn't turn them into a negative profit situation. Higher cost is going to translate into the higher prices, meaning, yay, we introduce competition, but this competition actually ends up pushing up the price because they're going to have to share this quantity, lower quantity, meaning higher costs. So in these kind of cases where we have huge amounts of upfront capital, we saw this in railroads, we see this in BC Hydro with our massive transmission lines all across the country, all across the province rather, right? Huge capital costs. It doesn't make sense to replicate these costs across many competitors. So what we do in the case of these kind of natural barriers, the government gives a firm a charter to operate. They say, yes, we recognize that you are a monopoly. Yes, we recognize that you're going to create a market failure. However, providing this service, even in an inefficient way, is preferred over this service not existing at all. So we will give you a charter and a right to operate. And in this way here, one firm is at least able to approach or arrive at its minimum efficient scale, where two firms may not be able to. So that's our idea, at least behind a natural monopoly, behind our natural barriers. What about our created barriers? We have a few different created barriers that are possible to exist. Uh, the first one we can take a look at for a created barrier would be a legal barrier. Right, a legal barrier, this is gonna be a case where you petition the government in order to create some kind of legal reason for there to be a barrier to entry. And you might be like, what? Why would the government provide law or allow a firm to lobby to get to become a monopoly, to earn monopoly level profits, entirely getting more producer surplus on the cost of consumers in society? Well, because they don't frame it that way, right? It's typically framed in areas of, well, we need this for safety, right? We see this with the dairy industry creating barriers to entry into the dairy market on the idea that, hey, we need to self-regulate. We need to make sure that our dairy is safe because otherwise children might die. Think of the children if they accidentally drink unpasteurized milk and they don't realize the potential dangers. We see this in the taxi industry with the taxi medallions, right? This whole taxi license that you need. Lobbying the government to say, no, 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 no. The only ones who are safe to drive people around are those people with taxi licenses. If you don't have a taxi license, well, how can you trust that they're actually a good driver? How can you trust that they'll have your best interests in mind? They might just drive you around in circles. Only by hiring someone with a taxi license, only by allowing those people with taxi licenses to do drive for hire, can you ensure people's safety, right? And so in these kind of ways, they convince the government to put in some kind of legal action to create a barrier to say, okay, you can only drive for hire if you have a taxi license. You can only sell milk if you're part of this dairy cooperative. You can only practice as a doctor if you have a license from the College of Physicians, right? All of these kind of things are legal barriers put into place in order to allow you to have monopoly prices, monopoly level profits. And sorry, okay, again, I'm saying monopoly level, not necessarily. All these barriers really just allow for the creation of market power. Even oligopolies had barriers, keep in mind. So it just allows you to prevent entry, which allows you very often to begin to act more like a monopolist is probably the best way to say that. So we would have these legal barriers being put into place. What we would also have is we'd also have, well, okay, underneath these created barriers, 
Well, we could do other things. The firm could begin to engage in heavy advertising. Thing is, advertising is extremely expensive, right? Advertising is a huge industry, huge cost to engage in advertising. As a result, for a firm to put a massive amount of money into advertising, well, really now their brand name becomes associated with the product. Any new entrant, in order for their brand to even be recognized, to even be accepted or to know what it is, they are going to have to enter into advertising in order to meet that. That is a huge extra cost, right? This is essentially just putting a huge cost barrier into place in order to eat away at the potential profitability of any new, any new uh, income. Other possible ones is that you can engage in predatory pricing. So predatory pricing, this here is essentially, hey, we see that there's a newcomer coming into the market. We drop our prices. We've been earning positive economic profit for so long. We can handle this. We'll just eat into our reserves for a while. We'll engage in this predatory pricing, lower our prices such that the newcomer can no longer maintain their profitability, continue until the newcomer leaves. As soon as the newcomer leaves, well, we can raise our prices back up and recoup our losses. If that doesn't work, you can always additionally just buy out your competition. That is, anytime a newcomer enters the market, you can just buy them out. And this is very problematic for competition, for new ideas and the like, and what we're witnessing more and more, unfortunately, in tech markets, right? We're seeing this rise in monopoly, oligopoly, really rise in market power in these tech sectors. And we see even new entrants into this tech sector. We see their business plans, their kind of hope isn't that they will create a new business that will, hey, challenge or get at the profit that Google is earning or that Facebook is earning or et cetera. No, no, no. Their business plan is to be noticed by Google so that they get bought out. That is problematic. That just allows a greater concentration of market power, a greater inefficiency altogether. So problematic in that sense and a created barrier in order to prevent entry, right? They can't enter if, you're, if they are now a part of you. So some kind of created barriers that could exist, that could exist in that case. Okay, these barriers, they exist in the short run. They exist in the long run to prevent entry. But what we also have is we do have a very long run time period. And keep in mind in the very long run, our definition of the very long run is that we can now change our technology. And okay, if you were an entrepreneur, you were tech savvy, you were an inventor, you wanted to kind of create a new invention, what is really worth your while to put your efforts, your energies into? It's going to be worth your while to target these monopoly, these oligopoly, these sectors that have large barriers put into place. They have these large barriers put into place to protect them from competition, to allow them to continue to earn huge profits. And so to be able to create a new technology to overcome these barriers could allow you access to those huge supernormal profits. And so this technological innovation has two kind of outcomes. It has the first one of creative destruction. Creative destruction. That is where you create a new product that revolutionizes the market so much that it has destroyed the old product altogether. You have made the old industry obsolete, right? Your new invention has just destroyed the existing marketplace. And now you have all the market power because you created it, right? In many ways, personal computing had, didn't, had done that to the typewriter, right? Typewriters virtually don't exist anymore, completely replaced by keyboards and personal computers. It was argued way back in early 2010-ish that tablet computers, iPads, were going to do that to laptops and the personal computer. Well, okay, it turns out that was a bit of a flaw. Tablets kind of petered out after a while. People realized that they were just large glorified phones and they weren't really that good to be productive on. But the idea was there that they were going to revolutionize our workplace and we'd see the destruction of our personal computer. Very similarly though, this here we've seen the rise of wireless, uh, we've seen the rise of streaming technologies, 
So Netflix, Crave, uh, what else do we have? Amazon Prime, all of these streaming technologies, they have by far and large destroyed traditional linear programming on cable television, right? They've entered into this market. They've overcome what was largely a natural barrier in the cable markets. They overcame this and they created a new streaming product that has almost completely destroyed the original. So some examples of creative destruction. Other things that can be done is it can be taken a look at creating new technologies to circumvent barriers, right? That is, you're not destroying the original industry. You are just creating a new technology that allows you to get around the barriers. And in this case here, a classic example of this is Uber and Lyft, right? Uber and Lyft ride sharing companies. Well, with the rise of smartphones and instant connectivity, well, that overcomes a lot of the safety aspect. You can be kind of sure like, hey, I'm not being kidnapped. Um, you also have with this as well, you know your route. You can look up on maps or the like, hey, this is the fastest route between A and B. So you don't even really need to trust that your driver isn't driving you in circles. You can confirm this. Then through kind of overcoming a lot of the safety concerns, they were able to lobby most governments around the world to overcome the existing legal barriers, saying, hey, look, all of those safety concerns raised, we've covered them off, right? We can provide the same service. You don't need these legal barriers in place anymore. And in that way there, through this new technology, through this new way of dealing with business, you can circumvent certain barriers. So two different ways that in the very long run, these barriers can be destroyed. So keep in mind with this, right? In the short run, a firm with barriers can earn economic profit. Mind you, in the short run, a firm without barriers can also earn economic profit. So here, here, let's, let's just do it this way. Let's write this down. Let's just actually write this down. Let's take a look. Short run, long run, very long run. Okay. And we're going to do with barriers versus no barriers. Okay. In the short run, yes, you can earn positive profit if you have barriers. You can also earn positive profit if you don't have barriers, right? So keep in mind that was perfect comp or what we'll get to as well, monopolistic competition. Up here, barriers, that would be a monopoly or a cartel and an oligopoly. And again, cartel only if they can create, say, a legal barrier. Taxi industry, for example, is a cartel that's created a legal barrier. In the long run, if you have barriers, yes, you can continue to earn positive economic profit. The barriers prevent entry. If you have no barriers, well, you're going to be driven to zero profit because of entry. Right? There's no barriers to keep out all the pests that were coming in to get your profit. So entry occurred, your profit was driven to zero. However, once you move to the very long run, well, in the very long run, both of these cases will be driven to zero profit because in the very long run, in both cases, we can have entry. Right? We can have entry, and this entry will drive the profit to zero. So you can kind of take a look at the role that barriers have there and how they temporarily allow firms to maintain hold of their positive profit. Right? Big question always gets asked, well, how long? How long is this for this to be driven all the way to zero profit? Well, that can take a long time, right? This is however long it needs to take for technologies to change to either engage in creative destruction to create to destroy the original market create a new one or to circumvent those barriers altogether and that's not a fast process this could be decades this could potentially be decades uh, it could be years right it could only be a few years again entirely depending on the pace of technological change and depending on the market on whole okay so what we've seen taking a look at this we've taken a look at the monopoly uh, the monopolist rather 
We've seen how they figure out their profit maximizing level of output. And we figured out that, hey, at their profit maximizing level of output, they do not have an allocatively efficient outcome. That is by having their market power, by choosing their quantity and thus choosing their price, by willfully holding their output below where that allocative efficient level would be, they create a market failure. They create a case where the marginal social benefit is above the marginal social cost. And thus we have a loss of social welfare. So we took a look at that. We then moved on to take a look at a cartel to say, hey, look, if cartels are allowed to form, we have the same issue. We saw though that cartels are inherently unstable. It's very rare to find a cartel that is able to control its members and prevent entry. The taxi industry being one case that was able to maintain its cartel for a long period of time. We then moved on to finish off taking a look at barriers. We took a look at natural versus created barriers, and we took a look at how new technologies allow for either creative destruction or for the circumvention of barriers. Right, to talk about more about that creative destruction, you can think about in many provinces here in Canada, the telephone, telecom, was a natural barrier. Huge upfront capital cost to run telephone wires to every single household within the province. As a result, most provinces had just one public telephone company. In BC here, it was BC Tel. Well, over time, we had a new technology being wireless, right? Being the use of cell phone networks. Now you didn't have to connect every single household together. You just had to put in cell phone towers here and here and there here. In that way there, this overcame that huge upfront natural barrier. It allowed entry. And we were able to witness now the rise of Shaw, Bell, Rogers, Telus, all of these firms enter into the telecommunications market, providing telephone services where they never could before. So in that case there, that was just a new technology, wireless networks that allowed them to circumvent the original, the original wired telephone. If you have any questions about any of these, about a monopoly on whole or why it creates a uh, market failure due to their market power, feel free to reach out to me either through D2L Frequently Asked Questions or through the email. Thanks. Till next time.